Good. So once again, you know, you're all welcome to today's class. So approach to ear pain. So one thing I have to understand is this ear pain or ear ache can originate from any of the three parts of the ear and may be referred. Okay. So ear pain can originate from the external ear, the middle ear, the, the inner ear, or ear can be referred pain. Okay. So these are the things you want to pay attention to. The cause of ear pain is usually otologic. So even though ear pain can be referred, most of the time the cause of ear pain is from the ear itself. In young children who are most frequently affected by ear infection. So if I was preparing for an MCQ exam, which is part of the uh, the QE one exam, you realize that I will. That is one thing I'll note. For example, which class of people are most commonly affected by ear pain? Number one, adolescents. Number two, uh -huh. pediatric patients. Number three, adults. Number four, children. Then, because of what the um the MCC objective or the rationale has stated, in young children who are most frequently affected by ear infections. A good otologic exam is crucial. So I'll make a note of that. Ear infections are most commonly aff affect children. And I'll be very glad that you make that note as well in your notebooks right now as we study this, okay? And I'm picking this basically from the MCC objective. That is why I'm quoting that objective. And we are doing medical expect ear pain. Simple, we are covering everything today. So the, the, the rationale stated that ear pain can come from any of the three parts of the ear. Number one is um, uh, number one is the middle ear. Number two is the inner ear, and number three is the outer ear. And so we are going to look at ear pain affecting all these three places, and then how to approach the exam with them. Now, the objective, the objective goes this way: giving a patient who has ear pain, the candidates will diagnose the cause, the severity and complications and initiate an appropriate management plan. The cause, the severity, the complications and initiate an appropriate management plan. In particular, careful and complete head and neck exam is required, especially with a normal appearing ear canal tympanic membrane and middle ear. And the reason why they brought this up is because we talked about the fact that ear pain can come from the outer, the middle or the inner ear, and it can also be referred. So if you have a patient who has ear pain and you don't see that maybe the cause of the ear pain is any of these three areas, then you want to do an examination of the head and the neck to make sure where is this pain coming from? Because at times, shingles itself can even cause ear pain. So this is what you want to pay attention to, okay? Now, if you remember, there's this book I always make reference to. It's called Tintinale, Emergency Medicine, a Comprehensive Guide, Study Guide. This is the book the Medical Council of Canada wants you to use for your emergency medicine preparation. It says otitis media is the most common outpatient pediatric diagnosis. Can you imagine otitis media is the most common outpatient pediatric diagnosis? And this can be found in Tintinale Emergency Medicine, a comprehensive study guide, seventh edition, page 755. Now, when someone has said this and you are preparing for a board exam, the easiest thing you need to do is ask yourself, common things are common. If I'm preparing for an exam, one of the objectives of the exam is approach to ear pain. And then I'm reading from the textbook, which is suggested by the medical council itself. And the textbook is saying that otitis media is the most common outpatient pediatric diagnosis. What I would do if I'm Dr. Anjana, Dr. Rajdeep, Dr. Radia, like whoever I am preparing for this exam, I'm going to make sure that no matter what, I master otitis media. Please, are you following me? Because the exam body says that, look, we are going to, one of the objectives you need to cover for the exam is approach to ear pain. Then they said that if it comes to emergency cases, review Tintinale. Then you go to Tintinale and Tintinale opens one of the chapters and says that otitis media is the most common outpatient pediatric diagnosis. 
if I were you, I'm going to make sure that Otitis Media is covered in every way possible before I go into the exam. So, the peak incidence of Otitis Media is between six months and 18 months of age. So, we are going to take our time to review Otitis Media very critically and use the MCC objectives one by one by one by one to make sure we cover everything. So the peak incidence of otitis media is between six and eight months of age. This is something I would have written in my textbook if I'm studying with metacognito right now. Okay, now I have a question and I want you to type in your answer. You are assessing children in the pediatric otorhinolaryngology clinic. That's the pediatric ENT clinic. The following are risk factors for otitis media. Choose as many as possible. Please type your answer. Is it A, Native Americans, B, Eskimos, D, um, C, females, D, daycare attendees, E, children exposed to tobacco smoke, F, children born with craniofacial abnormalities, G, supine position sleepers, H, pacifier users, I, Diagnosed with first episode of orchitotitis media less than six months. J, born with immunodeficiency syndromes. And K, non-breastfed children. Who has an increased risk of developing otitis media? So somebody will go, oh yeah, I've covered otitis media. Really? Have you really covered otitis media? So today we're going to use that to really help us. Have you really, really covered otitis media? Daycare attendees. So I can see that people are writing. So the following are risk factors. So we are looking at risk factors for otitis media, risk factors for otitis media, risk factors for otitis media. And um, yeah, people are choosing various answers. What are the risk factors among this list? Number one, Native Americans. Number two, Eskimos. Number three, daycare attendees. Number four, Children who are exposed to um, 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 tobacco smoke. F, children with craniofacial abnormalities. H, children who use pacifiers. In fact, let me add this as well. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Burning K should be added. No, that's what I'm saying. Okay, you've added. Yeah, adding, okay, K yeah. is part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So children born with craniofacial abnormalities, H, children who use pacifiers, I, children who are diagnosed with first episode of acute otitis media less than six months, J, children who are born with immunodeficiency syndromes, and K, non-breastfed children. In other words, females have a lower risk of developing otitis media as compared to males, okay? Children who sleep supine have a lower risk of developing otitis media. So let's use this as a teaching point. And remember that those who are planning on writing the exam next year, next year there will be no CDM. So you want to make sure that you are sharp on your facts because when it comes to MCQs, MCQ is also basically, basically about facts. So for example, what is the teaching point? The teaching point is that what are the risk factors for acute otitis media? That's basically that. Number one, Native Americans, Eskimos, males. That's a risk factor. Daycare attendees, because you know they meet other babies and the other children, and they are spreading the thing among themselves. Children who are exposed to tobacco smoke, so maybe they have a parent who smokes. Children who are born with craniofacial abnormalities. Children who sleep prone, like that, okay? Children who use pacifiers. Children who were diagnosed with first episode of acute otitis media when they were less than six months. And children who were born with immunodeficiency syndromes. These are the children with risk factors for otitis media. So please, if I were you, I write all these down. Because you know, the first part of the exam, the 210 questions is, basically MCQs and MCQs is facts. You have to just know, you know, facts about the various objectives. So for me, if it comes to otitis media, this is one fact I want to make sure that I memorize very well. Doctors, can I move on? Can I move on? 
And don't forget, I will be sending the replay of this. So there's no need to worry so much about it. Okay. Now, what is breast? What is the relationship between breastfeeding and otitis media? Because we brought that in the question as well. The incidence is lower in infants who are breastfed. So otitis media risk and incidence is lower in children who are breastfed as compared to children who are not breastfed. So if you have a child who is breastfed, that child is protected against otitis media more than a child who is not breastfed. Okay? So that's another thing. So you are assessing children in the pediatric otorhinolaryngology clinic. Which organisms are implicated in otitis media? Let me let me add that. Otitis media. Can you type your answers for me, please? Which organisms are implicated in otitis media? Staph aureus, H. influenzae, strep. By the way, which of them is your top three? Top three organisms. Yeah, there's the elements of staph aureus, but the three organisms, which the top three are strep pneumo, H. influenzae, Muraxella catahalis. Strep pneumo, H. influenzae, Muraxella catahalis. Strep pneumo, H. influenzae, Muraxella catahalis. These are the most common pathogens in the post pneumococcal vaccine era. So after we, in fact, before they introduced the uh, pneumococcal vaccine, strep, group A strep, staph aureus were also as common as strep pneumo, H. influenza, and Moraxella. But when pneumococcal vaccine was introduced, the top three organisms which cause otitis media are strep pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella catahalis. So please keep that in mind as well. And these organisms are implicated in a lot of upper respiratory tract infections and even some lower respiratory tract infections like pneumonia as well, okay? So if you know this, otitis media, sore throat, you know, pneumonia, you're good. These three organisms, strep pneumo, H. influenza, and Moraxella. Doctors, can I move on, please? I want to make sure. So now, next question. Neonatal acute otitis media is very common, true or false? Neonatal acute otitis media is very common, true or false? Neonatal otitis, acute otitis media is very common, true or false? True. True. False. False. Neonatal acute otitis false. is true or false? True or false? False. So the answer is false. 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 Yes, false. come on, six months to 18 months. Yes. <laughs> we were neonate, neonates are newborn babies, right? So you see, it, that, that fact was given, but many people did not pay attention to it. If you can see, we, we, we learned it somewhere. Where is it? I'm just going by here. That peak incidence of otitis media is between six months and 18 months of age. That's the peak incidence. And then, and then I dropped a question um, which says that neonatal otitis media is very common. True or false? The answer is false, okay? Neonatal acute otitis media is uncommon. This is also from Tintinale. It is uncommon. Okay. Next question. Most effusions in the neonatal period are sterile and start right after the birth of the baby. True or false? If a baby has otitis media and develops effusion, most effusions in the neonatal period are sterile and start right after birth of the baby. True or false? No. False. False. <laughs> hey, you know, as I said, you know, somebody will go like, oh, otitis media, mm, easy. I finished it. But that is why we have these tutorials, right? Most effusions in the neonatal period are sterile and start right after birth of the baby. So this is, this is also teaching us an exam-taking trick. There are two... Three facts here. Most effusions in neonatal period, that's one, are sterile. That's two. And start right after the birth of the baby. For this statement to be true, that means all the three facts should be right. That most effusions in the neonatal period, they are sterile. That is a true fact, frankly. But do they start right after birth? That is the question you should ask yourself. No. Most effusions in a neonatal period start when the baby is in the womb, in utero. So even though this point about the effusion is sterile is true, the fact that it starts right after birth of the baby is false. 
So then the whole statement becomes false. These doctors, are you following me? So the answer is false. And the teaching point is that most effusions of the middle ear in this age, that's in the neonatal period, are sterile. That is true. And they develop in the in utero environment. So we are still building on otitis media approach to ear pain. So doctors, please follow this very carefully. Most effusions in the middle ear of neonates, they are sterile. Most of the time, they will resolve on their own. But then when do they develop? They develop when the baby is in the uterus of the mother, not when the baby is born. 